I'm very excited and honored to have with us uh, Mr. Gil Shued. Um, my name is Yochai Meital. I'm a co-founder and senior producer of Israel Story. Uh, before I introduce Gil, I just want to say that this event is brought to you by uh, the generosity of the congregation of Bet Shalom in Teaneck. Hi, Eric and uh, Elaine. Um, thank you so much for this. Uh, and we hope to be back in Teaneck very soon in our you know, flesh and blood. Um, so, uh, Gil. Hi, Gil. I see you're here with us, right? Hi, good evening. Or Hi, good morning. So I don't know wherever. It, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Yeah, it's not clear. We have people here from uh, South Africa, from uh, Portugal, from Brazil, from North America, of course. So, Gil Schwed is the co-founder and CEO of Checkpoint, uh, a company that helped usher in the, the startup revolution that is... Uh, really shaped what Israel looks like today, both internally and externally, in terms of our image and our exports, what we bring to the world, um, and is also basically the godfather of cybersecurity in general. So, hi, Gil. Hi, good, uh, as I said, good wherever you are. Yeah, and we're both, I see, we're both rocking the um, virtual background here, which is nice. So, um, Gil, how, how, I, I just wanted to start with asking you, first of all, saying happy Yom Um How, how yeah. was your Yom Ha'atzmaut? What did you do? I know you're, I know you're a, a big um, food, uh, foodie and you love cooking. What, what's on your grill this Yom Ha'atzmaut? So we actually, I have here a big family. So for us, for me, it was a terrific Yom Ha'atzmaut. We didn't go out to the streets and I didn't have to worry about my kids running, you know, uh, with the uh, spray and the... Uh, uh, all these strange games that uh, we play in Yom Ha'atzmaut crowded in the streets. I have six kids, so we had the plenty of activity at home. We cooked uh, very Israeli things from my, my wife did the homemade falafel. I made my homemade, which is not homemade new style shawarma, which is nothing to do with shawarma. It's actually beef tenderloin with five types of sherry tomatoes. Uh, so it's uh, oh my God, so we had a great. nice celebration yesterday and today. <laughs> wow. Um, so uh, we're, I'm going to jump right in. Um, and I want to ask you about actually, um, I mean, Gil, you've been interviewed and you've talked on stages so many times over, over your career. Um, so I wanted to actually start with sort of giving you the, the mic sort of and telling you what, what you would, if you had the chance to sort of decide what would be the opening question, what would you want people to know about you and about Checkpoint in, gen in general? I think I can, I mean, usually I start by speaking about Checkpoint and the cyber world, and you can see my background, the cyber map, which is not stopping under the corona, and the, the importance of bringing cybersecurity to the world. The last two months, I think we were all busy on one hand securing the world, which is still essential and still important. On the other hand, is transitioning the entire way we work and we live, and that's have been a a very, very interesting uh, two months for me, transition, everything I knew about how to run the business into a very different perspective. A lot of it's changed my mind about how to manage and uh, how to work. Oh, that, that's ex that was actually going to be my next question. How, how, has, this, um, how has this whole uh, Corona thing affected uh, Checkpoint and your business? And what have, you, have you learned any lessons from it that you could share? So I think in terms of cybersecurity, cybersecurity is still needed. The hackers don't, still, don't stop and the hackers always work, always work remotely and always work from home. And by the way, right now they are finding new methods for, um, for creating new malicious things from an application of the World Health Organization for your mobile phone that happened to be a malicious application uh, to a... Uh, uh, websites that try to uh, provide the corona information or access to Zoom links and they, again, they become phishing sites or malicious sites that when you access them will infect you. So we are fighting all of that and we are helping our customers. We're also seeing that, uh, like us, all of our customers move to work from home. And that means that they need increased capacities for some internet links. They need what we call remote access VPN, secure networks that will allow them to work. And there's different environments. There's like a like shipping company that moved from 8,000 remote employees every day to 80,000, a bank that moved to 130,000. 
and even more uh, human and touching stories like uh, how we created for a hospital an environment the doctors that were put on quarantine because they were exposed to corona patients have to be quarantined at home now we allowed these doctors to monitor the patients at the hospital remotely in a secure manner that's something that the hospital never did the hospital you know the doctor is on site they're not working from home and uh, under this special situation we solved the solution for the hospital or we created a new solution to really allow quarantine doctors to monitor corona patients which is a very interesting uh, application so uh, the entire world of work has also changed not just security and your and your engineers and your workers are doing all of this from home yep we are i mean for me i mean my sales force for example is always working on the road and is always working remotely they have to learn how to meet their customers now without meeting them virtually but then the engineers and the entire uh, technical services organization and the development we used to work exclusively from the office we have labs we have development environment and I never wanted our intellectual property to leave the office. So I actually insisted that we all work from the office. And here we had like almost 2,500, actually more, if I include the other centers. About 3,000 employees that we have to transition, to complete new work environment and how to connect remotely from home to the office, get the same facility capabilities, do it securely. Again, we're in security, so it's not just accessing the office, it's doing with security. It took us about two weeks and we were able to complete that transition. And for myself, that I've never worked from home, I always like to go to the office and work from the office. I'm like uh, now five weeks or six weeks, I don't even remember, straight at home and uh, living on Zoom. Yeah, I know t time seems to just uh, lose its meaning almost. I have no idea what day it is or week or month. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that actually, I want to ask you about that because you talk about working. I know you're a very hard worker and you come to work early every morning and you, you co-founded Checkpoint in 93 uh, together with uh, your partners, Shlomo Kremer and Marius Nacht. Um, and it's quite rare for, for uh, um, somebody who's the head of a startup uh, founder to remain CEO for so long. Um, Checkpoint's market value is now, I think, about $15 billion dollars. Um, and is a market leader in the area of cybersecurity. Um, you've changed the nature of the business uh, several times since you started. You now have about 5,000 employees worldwide. Um, how have you managed to remain CEO for so long? And especially, how do you sort of keep the passion and energy going? First, I think for me, it's been a tremendous growth. I started Checkpoint when I was 24, when I was a software developer, I learned almost everything I could learn from how to create a product, not just how to, not how to be a programmer, but how to make it a product, how to work with customers, how to recruit employees, what's the, what it's like, uh, the financial markets, like moving from Israel, we are a global company, 98% of our sales are outside Israel. So how to work in a global environment, I've learned everything. And one of the things I like in my job is that I learn new things. And technology, by the way, essentially is changing all the time. You cannot say we've been great, we've been the market leaders uh, 25 years ago. You have, to, uh, you have to reinvent yourself all the time. So that's something we, we've, that we've been doing. For me, it's a huge learning experience. I mean, the kind of CEO that I'm now is quite different than what I used to be five years ago. And In what way? Years ago. In what way? Um, when I started, I, I'm, first I learned how it's like to be a, a manager, not just an engineer. And then, I, and then we were a very small company. For the first two years, almost we've been three people. So we did everything ourselves. Then as we grew, I was, I'm, I'm a very hands-on person. From developing the product to doing uh, slideshows to uh, meeting uh, customers. Uh, I've, I've ran almost every role in the company. HR, finance, you name it. So, and each one of them was a learning experience. Um, and every time it's a transition, managing a hundred people, you know everyone and you meet everyone. Managing a thousand people, you start to create additional layer. In the last five years, for example, I've moved to much more strategic management and less uh, being hands-on. Some people that, again, I, I'm probably still more hands-on than some CEOs in the market, but 
how to develop a team that you can trust. I mean, a lot of it is how to delegate and trust the people around you. And every few years it changes. And um, today I think I have a team that uh, doing much more than much more tasks that I used to do five years ago and 10 years ago. Um, so before I go on to my next question, I just want to, I, I kind of uh, forgot, sorry about this to the audience. This is, this is new to me. You know, the, uh, when we met last time, Gila, I started the interview by telling you um, that we're, uh, this is, everything is um, going to be edited. And if you want to rephrase yourself, you can rephrase yourself and, uh, or omit something you can omit. This is a new beast for us, you know, doing everything live here. So uh, um, it's real time. Anyway, I forgot to tell the audience if they have any questions or anything like that uh, to present to Gil, please write them, write them down in the chat and uh, we'll, ask, uh, we'll ask Gil. Um, Gil, I wanted to uh, take you back now and to, I mean, to, to those of you who are less familiar with Checkpoint or don't know exactly what the product is, Gil, you, you were one of those people who sort of realized that the internet was going to be a big thing when most of the world thought it was just a way for academics to send information to each other. And you realized that it was going to be a lot more than that. Um, can you, I was wondering what, how, you, how you had that intuition, what made you think that or realize that? And uh, if you can give a sort of layman's explanation to what your sort of initial product was, the, the stateful inspection, which you uh, patented in 1993. I'll tell a little bit about my background. I started the program when I was 10 years old. At the age of 12, I got my first job. Since I was 14, I was a regular employee and uh, spent all, most of my time, not all my time, working and uh, with training to what, uh, to, to what I became. And that fascinated me. And, when I was, I mean, when I was in the army, I again dealt with computers and uh, did the same kind of jobs I did before. And I got exposure to the internet. Initially, the internet, for those that don't know, in the 80s and 90s, early 90s, the internet was a purely academic network when universities from all over the world can exchange information. It wasn't about the web. The web was invented only in 93, 94, actually after Checkpoint started. It was about sending files, sending emails, remote access to systems. And at the university, it was a revolution. I saw a scientist that before send the article for peer review and it takes two months, suddenly send it and get the response overnight. Uh, as a software developer in the early 90s, I saw a... Uh, I saw the huge potential of it. I was in Israel. I worked with uh, companies in America. Before that, sharing my software was either sending again the diskette by mail and it will take two, three weeks and then you get some feedback. And it's, again, we can't even think about cycles like that today. Then you could have dialed on the modem and it would disconnect and it would take hours and it would cost uh, $5 a minute. So if you have to send a big file, it would be thousands of dollars and that was a nightmare. And then came the internet in 90, the end of 92, the beginning of 93, and they dis decided that the American authorities, that the internet will become open. And I said, whoa, that's a huge revolution. For someone like me in a small country, I can be part of the world. I, I can click on a file and it's there in a few seconds. And I don't have to pay by the minute. And we can share information and I can, I mean, there's a new product in the marketplace. I can access the information. I don't have to wait for the physical brochure to go to the local distributor. I can be part of the world. So for someone from me that comes from a small country, from Israel, I saw the revolution to be part of the global world. And the first thing that people asked on the internet was what about security? How do we prevent all of these by students from 15,000 universities uh, connect to our, uh, to our uh, network. I mean, we want to make sure that all these students in uh, smart ones in MIT or Caltech or other 15,000 institutes don't get to the company network and we want to connect. It was mainly the R&D department. I had in my mind the idea for security technology. I had it from my army days and it was a good idea that I kept in my mind, but I never found an attractive market. And then I called my two partners, Marius and Shlomo, and I told them, you remember my idea from two, three years ago? Here is an exciting market. It's small, but that's the new world. That's the open world. That's how everybody's going to communicate. And uh, that's where we started Checkpoint. 
Uh, it turns out we were right on the direction. I mean, the internet did become quite significant in our life. It probably became at least a thousand times bigger than what we could imagine in 1993. So, I mean, it's not that we knew how the world. And maybe the last point, when you look at our life today in the corona, I mean, I'm saying it all the time. Look at our life. Can you imagine the life without the internet? It's pretty hard. When you look at the corona, what it would be to have corona 10 or 20 years ago. 10 years ago, we had the internet, but we didn't have all this video and conferencing and high bandwidth and uh, watching Netflix, watching movies. We would go crazy at home. 25 years ago, it would be a disaster. We would be locked inside our houses, not knowing what's going on in the streets. We would, uh, I can't imagine going through this period of time 25 years ago. Actually, that you mentioned Netflix, and that um, it's a great segue for my next question, which is something um, um, that's been actually been on my mind, and I have a feeling that other other people here it's been on their mind as well. Sort of the issue of screens, and I wanted to ask you both as a technologist and as a father, as you mentioned, your six kids. Um, I know that you met your first uh, computer when you were ten, and it uh, and it as you as you talked about, and it changed your life completely. Um, these days, of course, kids meet their first screen basically the minute they're born. Um, and um, recently, there's, there's been a lot of talk about uh, sort of the harm of screen to development and to kids. Um, a lot of talk about, you know, how uh, um, Silicon Valley um, people are actually, um, you know, raising their kids in screen-free schools, etc. Uh, I was I very curious to hear what your take is on that. Uh, if you did you what what was your take of that as, as a father? Did you let your kids have screens? Do you think it's harmful? How do you see that? So I, I'm not uh, I would say I'm not an ed expert in education or in kids development. I can say as a human being, I actually like it. I mean the fact that my, and again these days demonstrate it. When my kids are locked at home for the second month now. I don't allow them to meet their friends. We follow the rules very strictly. We don't leave the house. We don't go to the shop, especially because we are a big family and so many people are at home. It's maybe it's very dangerous to bring things from the outside world. And uh, they are spending all their time with their friends. They can learn. They can even, so yes, they can watch TV. And actually it's fascinating to see my 12 years uh, all the kids watching the same uh, serious TV sitcoms that I like. And my 14 years old uh, starts to listen to uh, lectures on the internet. Again, most of the time he plays uh, electronic games with his friend, but again, he's with his friends. And that media, that screen is something that actually enabling us to, to be with other people and to learn and to do a lot of stuff that otherwise we would go crazy. So especially these days, I see the value of screens. And yes, my uh, one-year-old and uh, my two-year-old, they have twins that are two-year-old since the age of uh, one year, they know how to operate their iPad, they watch movies, and it's actually nice to see that. I think it's better than, you know, being passive in front of TV and watching something else. They actually pick their YouTube movies and, and they are active in that process. Um, they don't do it many hours a day, but uh, at the age of two, but uh, I, I like it. I like it that they have a world and they can operate things on their own. Um, yeah, you, thank you. That's interesting that you're, you're actually a pro. Um, I know that you say, you mentioned that you're not uh, an educator, but you are very active in a bunch of educational uh, initiatives. Um, and one of them is, we, we've talked about this before, is sort of your belief in, uh, you, you have a very strong belief in uh, sort of the potential of teenagers. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Uh, sure. I, I mean, first I'm chairing a, a what's called Tel Aviv Youth University, which is a, a subsidiary of Tel Aviv University, which basically take kids from the age of like 13 and bring them to academic studies. It's a, it's a vision of uh, Shimon Peres, our previous uh, president and prime minister at the time. Um, and he had this idea and then his vision was very clear. He says, we are in the top of our brain capabilities when we are at the age of uh, 13, 14, maybe 15. 
why do we wait, especially here in Israel, until somebody becomes 18, go to the army, going for another year to, re to relax from the army and school, and then going to university and actually start their academic life only at the age of 23, 24, usually, and starts to contribute to society when they are 30, when they're actually busy about, uh, you know, having a family and making a living. Think about that kid at the age of 15, their mind is much better. I mean, I mean they have a clean mind, open, smarter than any one of us at any age. Um, they can dedicate all their time to learning if they want to. Again, they don't have to worry about uh, the basic thing we worry about, whether it's making a living or even preparing food because they live at home. And that's how we started the Tel Aviv Youth University, which, which the program initially used to be called the Scientist of the Future. Um, and I think it is creating the generation of people that can push society to its next boundaries, not just in science, it can be in... Uh, it can be people that are social activists, it can be people that are uh, professors, it can be entrepreneurs, doctors, anything. And I think we're now at the eighth or nine, maybe even tenth year, I don't remember. And we see the first generation that are actually getting to that level. So I'm a big believer in what young people can do. And I think we need to let them experiment and not just sit in school and, you know, watch the teacher in the same curriculum that everybody is getting. Oh, that sounds amazing. I'm sure there's some amazing kids there. I wish that was relevant for me as a 15-year-old. I'm afraid I wasn't that, uh, <laughs> I probably would not have qualified. So I want to take a few questions from the audience here. We'll start with two really easy ones, because I think, I think the answer is just yes. But um, Deb asks, um, do you, does your company have a, an internship program for students all over the world? Yeah, we have an internship yeah. program. It was, we have... It's a little bit in San Carlos in our offices in the Silicon Valley, and we have a huge one in Tel Aviv. When we get students, by the way, from all over the world, when we mm -hmm. get people, uh, there is a few programs, several programs. There is Taglit Excel, there is many other programs. I don't even remember all the names, so I apologize for all the good people that are doing this job of bringing young people to Israel and participating. Maybe as a lesson from the corona, Again, up to now, my belief was that we need to work together at the office every day. I'm a huge believer in that. Now with the corona, my, uh, I'm becoming more open to remote uh, activities. So mm. maybe we will open it up to more uh, internship program for people from other location. But again, feel free to send us email at Checkpoint. It can be a, a Gil or gilme at checkpoint.com is the best address. And everybody that wants to be an intro will get a good... Uh, a good treatment on that will be treated seriously. Great, thank you. You heard it here from Gil. And um, another question here is that also I assume is just a quick yes is that is there a Canadian branch for this company? John? Yeah, we have John. the first, we have, we have field people all over the world in yeah. pretty much every developed every country. country. Yeah. Every country. And in Canada, actually, in Ottawa, we have a big center for technical services with like almost 200 people. Uh, Canada is a very good location from that, but people that come from many backgrounds, know many different languages, immigrants from all over the world. Uh, so yes, we have a few hundred people in Canada. So um, Jaffe, I think, or excuse me to the audience if I'm saying your names here wrong, but he's, uh, say, he's asking basically um, that um, the industry is littered with companies that are sort of shadows of their former selves. And I think it's definitely true that uh, the cybersecurity industry is one that changes rapidly. Um, how has Checkpoint managed to sort of be the exception and stay relevant and attuned to the new threats and the ever-developing market? So first, you're absolutely right, especially in technology. It's very, very hard to reinvent yourself. And the next generation always is the younger people with the new ideas. And you can see it in every industry. Still, you can see that uh, even in the internet, Companies like uh, Apple or Microsoft were able to reinvent themselves and still be relevant today. So that gives me some comfort that there is a chance to, uh, to redefine yourself and then do that. Uh, I think it's comprised of two things. First, what's your market? And I must say that cybersecurity is one of these markets that after 20, I'm now in checkpoint 27 years, after 27 years, it's more and more relevant and it's more and more important. So that's very, very unique because many markets 
you know, become the old market are being replaced. Cyber is still very, very relevant, much more than it used to be 27 years ago. Second one is the culture of the company. And I think what I'm trying to do is to, uh, I mean, first it's keep the good values that we bring. We're not here by mistake. We're not here because we're a new company every year. But on the same time, it brings some new spirit. And that can come, one aspect of that is I'm trying to recruit people uh, out of university, young people, not to bring, you know, in recruiting, it's the easiest way to recruit people that are like you. So if we have people that are 40 or 50 years old, to recruit people that are, you know, two, three years younger than us, that we know them, that we can trust them, they are like us, it's easy. It's mm -hmm. not the right choice. So most of our hirings are people directly outside of college or even people that didn't go to college and they can grow in that environment but they can also bring new ideas and reshape our thinking and connect to the new things and us that we are growing old and that we are a and sometimes we have to replace you know some of our previous generation and we still bring people that are uh, not 23 but uh, 43 or uh, or 53 or 63 to the company um, we are being augmented by, we are keeping the average age of the company young. And by the way, we've been very successful. I measure the average age of the company. And as we grow every year, we manage to keep the average age of, company, of Checkpoint almost constant, like after five and 10 years. Mm. So that's also like in keeping with what we talked about earlier about uh, the potential of young people. Yeah. Um, of course, we don't discriminate against people my age or... Uh, any age, so I want to be clear, but I like to bring the young thinking, the young mindset and people that can, you know, stay at the company for very long and grow with us and not people that, that exhausted them. Yeah, potential. yeah. Um, so this next, I'm gonna actually combine two questions uh, that come from uh, Ohad from Yafo and Maor from London. Um, so Maor is asking, um, what customers would you turn down? Um, and how do you feel about certain parts of the cybersecurity market offering their services to all kinds of sinister players out there? Um, I mean, I know recently there are companies like NSO, of course, is, is one uh, sort of uh, example that came into the news recently in the headlines for its uh, spyware Pegasus, I think, um, that was used um, to hack into uh, uh, human rights advocates and got into all kinds of scandals, but there are other companies like that. Um, and Ohad from Yafo who asks um, how Checkpoint and the cybersecurity sector in Israel in general stay clean? Um, what kind of an ethical code should they adopt in a world that is increasingly infringing on personal privacy and rapidly heading towards constant surveillance? That's an excellent question, and I have a lot of aspects to it. First, I must say, we are in the business of defense, not offense. I mean, the, the, the examples that you gave is two types of cybersecurity, defense and offense. When we look at our industry, it's about 95 to 99% defense, just to be clear. It's not two halves. It's, I mean, when you look at Israel, there's, let's say, about 500 companies in, uh, in cyber, 480 of them are defense, and 10 or 20 are offense. Um, I'm not going to defend the offensive companies. I may, they have, by the way, there's some of them are doing important job, uh, and but it's their job to explain what they're doing. We are in. A, I'm so happy that we're in the defense business. So when my research find the vulnerability in an application, and they do, we are immediately fixing it and notifying the company and helping the world defend against it, rather than using it or selling it so that people can break into other places. So I'm very, very happy and every day I meet with my research team and they find all these things uh, every week or two and they share with me their findings about the vulnerabilities of the world and every few weeks I tell them I'm so happy that we're in the defense business and we don't think about the negative implications. Now, the, the second part of the answer is not about, so from my perspective, I sell to everyone pretty much. I mean, there's some regulation about countries we can sell to or customers we can sell to, but generally everybody has the right to defend themselves and to prevent other people from breaking into their organization. And then my product is designed to just do that, not to invade on privacy or not to do any of that, which we're not doing. The second part of it is who should we worry about, about privacy? And again, I'm, I'm not trying to attack anyone. I'm just trying to say the people who keep our confidential information are not the cyber companies. 
The people who do that are the companies that we give it to them willingly. Google, Apple, Facebook, uh, and they provide tremendous service to us. We're doing, again, they're giving us free services that are unbelievable. But remember, we are giving them everything about ourselves. We're telling them what we're doing, who we are seeing, what's our interest level, what we're accessing. So everything we do, we give to these companies willingly, without them trying to spy on us. And if we think about privacy, that's the, that's the privacy challenge. Again, I'm, I have nothing against them. I think that uh, they're doing a good job, but we have to remember that. I think you're on mute, uh, Yochai. We can't, can't hear you. Thank you, thank you. Sorry. Um, so we have a question from uh, Scott who asks that, who, so he says that cybersecurity privacy and privacy issues seems to get to the heart of our freedom um, and our deepest concern. He's wondering what are we actually, what are we really protecting against? Stealing intellectual property, um, data leaking, governments uh, infringing on our, our, our privacy and arresting us. How do you assess the concerns of a, of a given society and secure it against bad actors? And what, what are you securing against, essentially? So actually, we're securing against all of the above and a few more. We have to realize the, in the, the way we are operating our world today, from the electricity to the water that comes to our house, all the way to the fact that we are meeting now using Zoom, which is an amazing tool, and we are accessing information. And again, these days it's so clear that we are spending all our time with these tools. If somebody hacks to any of these tools, they can take our life down. They can take our bank account, they can take our electricity, they can take our uh, conversations, not so they can spy on us. They can simply shut it down. They can, um, um, you know, get information to foreign governments. They can use it at war time. Again, if we think about the modern war, the next big wars will run on the internet. And one country can shut down the hospital. By the way, hospital, which is the previous interview here, that's an unbelievable environment. You can shut down a hospital quite easily, electronically, remotely, and nobody would even know who did that. So you can't even attack back. There is no, the element in the, in physical security, you always have the element of you can attack back. They won't attack you because they are afraid. They're not afraid on the internet. They can, they did it, by the way. I mean, we've seen hospitals that were uh, shut down with the ransomware and had to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the hospital back to work. Uh, and it can be, again, it can be a criminal group that wants to extort money and it can be a foreign terrorist organization or a foreign government that wants to use that in a wartime and it can be some some kids just that's a, playing I'm, around. I'm just squeezing in here a sort of a follow-up question that relates to that so somebody's also asking is there a difference uh, in how you defend uh, networks against uh, sort of nation states or, or you know a sort of military uh, run uh, out, uh, hacking operation and sort of uh, lone hackers or, or something like that? No, they all use the same tool and that's another characteristic of the cyber world. In the physical world, you can say, you know, a terrorist or a criminal or a street criminal doesn't have access to your F-16 or F-35 or strategic missiles. In cyber, they do. The government may develop, the NSA in America may develop an amazing set of attacking tools. And two years later, they are leaking or somebody finds them and, and they are taking them and publishing them to the world, which um, this is a real story that's happened. The entire NSA toolkit of attacks was exposed to the world. And now every hacker in the world, and we've seen it, uh, you can use the same tools that the most, uh, the strongest nation and the smartest developers have developed to attack other countries. So in the, in the internet world, there's no huge difference between fighting or not fighting, defending against a different government or defending a, a kid in Eastern Europe or in Africa that's taking these tools and hacking back. And by the way, this kid can sit everywhere, in the street next door or in Africa. There are countries that their GDP depends a lot in, the, in the cyber crime because they don't have the means to enforce not doing that. Hmm. So um, I'll just one more question here from listeners and I want to ask one of my own here because I'm not getting to them at all. But they, a lot of questions here. People are full of questions for you, Gil. 
Um, so Mike uh, Cohen wanted to know if you're hearing a lot about, about many cases of uh, nonprofit organizations that are being hit by ransomware attacks. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's non-for-profit. It's, again, it's everyone. It's not just non-for-profit. It's mm -hmm. everybody gets hacked. They, our customers are more, I mean, we have products everywhere. And again, feel free to go uh, yeah, yeah, have yeah. products for consumers and so on. But 99% of our business is the enterprise world. It's companies from, you know, from low firms mm -hmm. with 50 people all the way to uh, the Fortune 100 companies uh, in the world. Um, so most of our business is with mid-size and large customers, but the need is the same need and, the, and everybody needs to defend themselves, yes. Yeah, so I, I wanna, we, we need to wrap up soon. Um, I wanted to ask you one more question. I remember when we last talked, you said something that sort of stuck with me um, yeah, about, uh, and I found, found very fascinating. Um, you made this claim that most of us uh, don't use nearly our full sort of potential uh, cognitive capabilities and potential. Um, can you talk a little about, about that, what you mean by that, and, and how we can sort of use more of our, of our potential? So first, I'm a huge believer in the potential that's in all of us and everybody mm -hmm. around us. And again, at least for me, I feel that I demonstrated some of it. You know, I grew like a regular normal kid in Jerusalem. I uh, uh, and because I was motivated, I, I learned a lot. I've, uh, uh, I never, by the way, finished my uh, academic studies, but I was a student in the university when I was uh, 15 or 14 uh, and started a big company. So I'm a big believer that everybody can do that and all you need to do is work hard and put yourself to that. My belief is that on a regular day, we use about between 10 to 30% of our uh, capabilities as human beings, of our brain. And if we really focus and we, go to, we get it up to the 100%, we can do five times more than we do. I'm not sure that we can all do it every day, but if we do it for even for a short period of time, we can make big jumps in life. So if you take, uh, and by the way, um, other uh, non-for-profit organization that I'm participating here are applying that principle, not from me, they invented it. To kids that are in under a, to kids that are dropouts from school, and they'll do a marathon, and the kid in one week would learn and make up for a, eight years of lost education in mathematics or in English at school. So I mean, it's unbelievable to see that you take the most kids with the biggest problems at school, and in one or two weeks they can make up for everything they didn't do for six or seven or eight years. So I think we can all do that. And even the method of doing small uh, marathons like that can get us to the next uh, step in life or make us do a big jump and learn something new. All right. Thank you so much, Gil. Um, I think we'll finish with that. I want to thank you again so, so much for your time and wish you a Yom Atzimut Sameach.